thank you for this uh, welcome. Um, actually, I would even like to take one step back and introduce the whole track. The fact that the startup day has found a psychology track, and Carl was one, one, one of the first speakers on that track, is because we at Contriber Ventures and me beforehand believe that the team and the actual even going even smaller, the actual founder, CEO, the vision holder of the company is one of the key elements anything you can do in the entrepreneurship world. So we have this kind of storyline going starting from co-founders, which Carl just introduced and we will talk about now on, on the topic of trust and we will continue to the effective responsibility and how to use a mentor. So it's all forms part of, of this founder psychology track and it's all the mentors, uh, uh, all the speakers that you are hearing in this track are part of the Cocoon founder psychology mentoring program. That's something new that we started now here in, in Tartu and I feel that Tartu is the right special place to actually start, start this kind of new, new initiatives. So, I would like to uh, invite Mark Ashton and Skinner Lane on a stage and we will start our panel. Can you tell a little bit of, as an introduction for yourself, starting with you? Um, my name is Skinner Lane. I'm the founder of Exosphere, which is, we describe ourselves as a learning and problem solving community. Uh, we've been working uh, in Latin America and Europe um, in the sort of intersection of philosophy, psychology, and emerging technology for the last. Uh, seven years or so, and I, I sort of consider myself a, a philosophical therapist. Um, help people unpackage the thoughts that they have, discover the origins of those thoughts, discover conflicts in the code that uh, are taking place up here, and to try to pick them apart and, and debug that code for, for better functionality and uh, life fulfillment in addition to professional success. Thank you. Mark. Uh, for uh, many years, uh, I have um, uh, led businesses and consulted uh, and acted as a coach and a mentor for businesses uh, in the UK and in the US. Um, Resolve is a close-knit community of uh, business leaders and subject matter experts who all love solving tough, difficult business problems that prevent uh, breakthrough uh, changes in performance. Um, and uh, we follow, try to follow the principles which we've researched uh, into the most uh, long-term, consistently profitable organizations. Uh, and a lot of that comes back to how people behave, uh, their attitudes, their behaviors, and their habits. Thank you. So the topic is trust. So I like to approach this from the other extreme. So what can be achieved without trust? Mark. Um, the reality is that the world shows us that quite a lot can be achieved <laughs> without trust. Um, but then what tends to happen is at some stage it goes spectacularly wrong. Um, and usually it is not achieved uh, without a great cost along the way. And that cost takes different forms. Uh, it can of course be financial and economic. Uh, it can be uh, in terms of relationships, uh, health, uh, well-being, um, and ultimately, uh, yeah, in terms of the the impact on the individuals concerned, uh, because it invariably ends up being toxic. Uh, and I've seen many, many examples of that over the years. 
So, from your perspective, what's actually alternative to trust? So if there is no trust, what can you use? Fear. I mean, the, the, the real alternative to trust is, is fearful behavior. The assumption that the other person is going to, and, and, and we, can, we can sort of dissect trust just a little bit and talk about affirmative trust versus negative trust. And Carl sort of alluded to these two kinds of trust where affirmative trust is, I, I trust that if I give you a task to do, it will get done with some level of confidence. Um, and negative trust is, I trust that you won't hurt me. Uh, and, and within both of these, you, you, you can see fear uh, or fearful behavior as an alternative. Um, micromanagement, which very few people enjoy being the recipient of, is a form of fear-based management. Uh, it is, I don't expect that you will actually do what you're supposed to do or not with a high, you know, sufficient level of confidence. So I'm going to like say doing it the way I think it should be done. And of course, this destroys creativity and, and has a lot of other negative impacts. And, and similarly, if I, uh, I can, in, with negative trust, uh, I could, I, if I go around in my business dealings and I assume the other person is trying to harm my interests, I'm going to be more defensive, I'm going to uh, maybe even think about trying to harm them first or get some kind of leverage over them. And, and this can take you, you know, very far, especially in politics. Um, if I think that you, but you end up building a house of cards. And, and eventually enough people witness this fearful behavior in you and they don't trust you either. And, and at some point, you, uh, a person that decides to, to navigate the world through this fearful or, or you could say Machiavellian behavior will eventually find themselves quite alone in the world. And, and, and then, with no allies, the house of cards collapses. Well, indeed, uh, I think a common form of human behavior is that many people have what I call uh, very well-developed crap detectors. That they can see through people, but very often they are forced, they are coerced into going along with those people. Um, when those people fall off their pedestals, as they very often do in the end, then people uh, often uh, take various forms of retribution. So, but who is responsible in a team or in a company, in a startup, to actually create trust? Well, I think that the, the leadership is always by example and service. If you have something that is not service-driven and, and example-driven, it's not leadership. It can be management, it can be a lot of other things, but the, the founder, management team, whoever these, the most senior people in an organization must first trust the people around them if they also then want to, to have that trust reciprocated, I think. And I would say, um, I regard businesses, particularly startups, small businesses, entrepreneurial ventures in the same way as I regard families. Uh, families without deep trust are toxic places. Um, and so, uh, everybody is responsible for acting with trust. Uh, Clearly, it comes from the founders. It has to start with the founders. Um, but you need to create an environment in which people feel safe. And without trust, people don't feel safe. So, is it possible that it doesn't start from the founders? Maybe there's some exception that, you know, somewhere in the world it happened once, but it, it seems really unlikely that it would, that it's a repli it would be a replicating model. But what breaks it? What breaks it? Why, what, what, what breaks the trust? Um, what is the blocker? There are lots of things that break trust, but in simple terms, uh, when people felt that they were on solid ground, and then they discover that they're no longer on solid ground, um, when things go wrong, of course, and you find out how people react, and you see a different side of them. Uh, it's, you know, the start of vibe is so positive, it's so engaging, it's so enthusiastic, you want to be part of it. There are lots of charismatic people. But the reality is that many 
many people don't see all aspects of those people's personalities. And it isn't that those people are necessarily bad or evil people, but they may not have the experience to be able to react properly to the unforeseen situations that will inevitably come along. And so when somebody that you thought, you know, that you looked up to, maybe behaves in a way that you just didn't expect at all, uh, and all of a sudden it feels like the, um, the rug has been pulled away from underneath your feet. Can you bring a personal ex example? <laughs> just one. <laughs> I'm a lot older than most people in this room, and it's happened several times. Um, one example I would quote is, uh, I ran a business in America as a very young man for five years, and uh, the, my boss, who, who led the company in the UK, uh, put in place steps to bring me back to the UK. Uh, meantime, the business globally went up, downhill very rapidly. Uh, and in the end, uh, what he did was he said, well, you know, you have a house in America. America's a great place to get a job. Um, you know, just stay in America and get a job. And he wouldn't even make the necessary steps to bring, bring my wife and I back to the UK um, when we committed to come back to the UK. That was a very brutal early lesson in, in trust. I, I would say uh, one brief comment first uh, is that I think money-related issues are the source of a lot of distrust in any kind of organization, whether that organization is a family or a business. And when, when leaders set certain expectations, and I think startup founders, as, as Mark is saying, many, many times are charismatic people, they want to generate optimism and positivity, and there's then a tendency to hide the brutal reality that a startup, by definition, is already bankrupt and just trying to get out of bankruptcy as quickly as it can. A startup is never not bankrupt, you know, just by definition. And when this reality is distorted in communication, then if one day the, there is um, missed payroll or some other kind of breach of an expectation, this can permanently ruin trust between, between people. And I think that this is where involving other people who uh, into the conversations about financial reality, uh, in, however bad it might be, and even at the risk that some people say, well, you know what, good luck, but I don't want to be here anymore. Taking that risk ensures that you don't breach the trust of everybody around you. And, and this is something that, I, that I've, I've seen both personally and, uh, and at a distance. I'm, I'm actually the advisor of a, of a startup right now where, where we've witnessed exactly this. The CEO was unwilling to tell the staff three months ago, we're running out of cash way sooner than we expected. Uh, and at some point, we're either going to have to let people go or we're gonna you know, miss some pay periods. And in, and in fact, in the end, they've had to let more than half of the team go. And, uh, and it, it just devastated morale. And it, 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 I've been through the similar things in, in my own startups in the past. And, and so I think that, that it, it hurts to trust that the other people are going to receive the truth with some level of understanding. And then also the willingness to endure the fact that some might not. And in fact, some might lash out, oh, you're stupid, how, did you, how could you possibly have mismanaged the money, or you know, whatever these things are, and just being willing to absorb that, knowing that it's the right thing to involve people in that conversation, and that in the long run, it's the only way to maintain any trust that has already been built. But have you been on the other end of the one who actually breaks the trust? The one who actually breaks the trust? Well, I, I think that, I mean, many times I have thought that I would be able to make a deadline with, with pay, make a, making a payment to somebody, and then when things fall apart on, on my side, um, there, there's this crisis of saying, well, and, and I think the, the internal justification pattern that's dangerous is to say, well, I didn't cause it. There was some, I, I was relying on somebody else's promises, and then those promises didn't come through, so it's not really my fault. But in fact, if I didn't disclose that risk, that, well, I'm making this promise to you, 
but it's it's contingent on this other thing that's going on, and so there's the possibility it might not happen under those conditions. Well, then I would be in perfect integrity with the with the truth. But if I say, well, I didn't know. I just expected the other person would come through, and I didn't think I should tell you that that was a contingency. Then it's definitely my responsibility. And this I've done this many times, and try to avoid that responsibility. And then it's the avoidance of the responsibility that then compounds the breach of trust. It makes it worse. It makes it, because it looks like I'm evading the responsibility and then people think, oh, so if that's true here, how many other categories is this true for? Uh, one of the things that we talk about often on the Kadoo Mentoring Program is the impact that our entrepreneurial instincts and activities have on our families, our significant others. Um, and if my wife was sat here, she would tell you that I've betrayed her trust many times. Um, certainly not inadvertently. Sorry, sorry, not, not deliberately, inadvertently. But I have to take responsibility for that. So um, she uh, grew used to my uh, enthusiastic and optimistic promises about what was going to happen with the business. And I've been, been an entrepreneur now for 13 years, 12, 13 years. Uh, and like many ordinary people, she craves security and stability. And uh, she was an unwilling accomplice to my entrepreneurial lifestyle. She's kind of gotten used to it now because she's had to, and we're still together. Um, but, uh, so facing up to your responsibilities and taking responsibility when you have betrayed trusted people, I think is an essential component of being a successful founder. And rebuilding the trust. And, and and being able to take responsibility is is the first step to rebuilding any any kind of trust that has been breached. So what's the second step? How, how to actually rebuild trust once it's... I, I think it requires a lot of really detailed communication about circumstances that otherwise you might not think were necessary to communicate about. So um, to open up basically, yeah, to share. Open okay. a lot of things that might, might previously nobody expected to be shared. Well, once, once that trust is breached, opening all of the books, uh, metaphorically and literally, uh, and saying, well, everything is open to inspection, and I'm open to inspection, and you can ask me the questions that you have. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And um, you know, what I would say is, you know, those of you who are founders, you know this. Uh, you feel betrayed. You feel let down. You feel people have betrayed your trust, and you are consumed by this. And yet, there are people who are consequently affected, whether they are your team or your family and others. Um, and that process of opening yourself up and accepting that that is the case and that you are responsible, even if you feel other people have caused it to happen, you are still responsible. And then that leads into uh, the commitment to ongoing communication and care for the people around you who are affected by your actions. And that's a crucial way in which the brain says, that you can regard business and entrepreneurship as a way of improving you and developing you and helping you grow. These are the sorts of things we're talking about. And, and I, I would like to add that um, the word responsibility gets treated with a bit of excessive abstraction, I think. And so I, I use the, the heuristic that, that if I'm trying to define my responsibility, that the word responsibility means ability to respond. So if there's anything that I can do, I may not be able to solve the problem alone, but that, and, and those are different things. A like complete power to take control of the situation is, is yeah. not the bar for responsibility. Responsibility is, well, can I say something to somebody as a result of this happening? And, and if, I, if I could do that, and it makes even the slightest improvement, if I haven't done that, then I, I don't get to say that I, I took responsibility in this situation. So, and I, I think that that's a, uh, if you treat responsibility as this abstract thing and not in concrete terms of, well, what, what actually is within my power to, to do as a, as a response to this situation? And then did I do all of the possible things that I could have to improve it? 
If I did one less, then I didn't really take full responsibility. There's also the saying that uh, you know, breaking trust is like having a crack in a dam. So there is no way you can take that crack out. Mm -hmm. But there is a way to respond to this situation by actually cutting it and bringing out new different facets, which means that you need to cut it open and, and, and share. So what are the benefits if you actually can rebuild or, or build from start the trust? What, what access to where? So for me, uh, you know, people talk about going through the pain barrier, don't they, to get somewhere that's worthwhile, you know, marathon runners, uh, top cyclists, whatever, top sports people. You have to go through the pain barrier. And the prize on the other side is a better and a happier you. Um, and that does not mean that all the problems get solved. It doesn't mean that your business is a a roaring success, it becomes a unicorn. Yeah? Actually, what matters at the end of the day is have you grown? Have you become a better, a happier, a more fulfilled person? And that obviously has to include your relationships, your, your life outside your business. Um, and so also, I think for me, one of the, the benefits of going through that breaking process and growing trust as a result of it, uh, is that your life comes into a much better balance. And ultimately that's got to happen. And of course that's incredibly difficult because what you're trying to do with your business is in fundamental conflict with the rest of your life, the amount of time you have available for other pursuits. And it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a uh, simplistic statement to say, you know, if you work hard you have to play hard. But the more time I spend uh, in entrepreneurial ventures and activities, the more I understand that to be true. I think that the, the rainbow uh, at the end of the storm of some breach of trust is that it, 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 is, a found, it is a new foundation on which uh, more complex forms of trust can be formed. That if you go through some situation where there, there is a, a breach of trust and then which, which tends to cause some fracture of a relationship or multiple relationships. If that can be repaired, then you end up with something that's stronger on the other side because then there is the empirical evidence that when things go badly, there is a willingness to come back to the table. There is a commitment to, to hang in there in a sense that in which means that you, the, the relationship is more likely to be able to endure much more significant levels of stress than it was before. So you know, just as when, when one uh, exercises muscles in the gym by lifting weights, actually creating scar tissue effectively that, that is strengthening, uh, strengthening you in the process, well that, that same scar tissue exists in, in broken relationships that if you, if you take the effort to then put it back together and give it a proper diet, it, it does grow and become stronger in a way that uh, that you can do things with a person uh, that you couldn't do with a stranger. You couldn't do with somebody who has this naive, oh, I just met you, you've never done anything bad to me before, so we're good, I can trust you. You can go only so far with that level of trust. And and, and so there, there, it doesn't, there are other ways to build the more complex forms of trust. So I, I don't recommend going out and intentionally breaching trust because oh, this is the only way that I can get a really trusting relationship. But if it happens, respond to it with the attitude of, well, something good could come out of this if we work at it. Can you, can you bring some practical examples of what? We're talking about building a company. Yeah? So what actually, if we have this trust in a team, what tools do I have at my hand otherwise? Let's say if the alternative is the fear. Fear brings in some tools. I can use some control and micromanagement and so on. What tools actually the trust brings? So, um, if you really understand the, the necessity of trust and 
how trust can work as a positive force and the way we can describe it, then it becomes inevitable that you need to find ways to uh, show more trust in the key people around you in the business. Um, so a practical example of this would be that uh, uh, within Resolve we have a business stream which we started off last year which is to help companies from the UK and Europe to investigate the market in the United States. Um, and like all typical founders, you know, in the early stages I'm exercising tight control over that. Um, but actually there is a guy within our business who is an expert in that area. He's a very quiet guy. He's extremely competent. Uh, and last year, he was measured by the UK uh, government, Department for International Trade, as being their most effective uh, part-time self-employed business advisor in the country. Um, so what became obvious in, in December, he and I sat down to talk, is that I'm pulled in too many different directions. I know where I want to focus. And it's just clear, you know, he was, he, in, his, in his lovely, polite way, he was kind of saying to me, Mark, can you just get out of the way and let me do this? Um, because he's going to do it far better than me. Um, so it's quite an obvious example for me, um, and I was pleased to do it. But there are many other examples of ways in which you can show trust in the people in your team, and they grow as a result, and their trust in you grows. A lot of people have this uh, idea that the one resource that you can't get more of is time. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, strictly false, in fact, uh, because trust is one of the ways that you can get yourself more time, in, in a certain sense. You can do more with the same amount of time, uh, and, and not just time, but also energy. And I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs account for time. Um, good entrepreneurs account for their time pretty well. They understand they don't have time to do everything. Um, but I think one of the forms of accounting that is done a bit less is energy accounting. Uh, the fact that we, we do have relatively strict limitations as to computational capacity of the mind and um, higher, higher order brain functions uh, aren't possible if we're taxed with uh, lots of detailed things, following up with people, uh, so trust is a way also to get more energy, more sleep at night. Uh, I mean, in a really literal sense, you know, you're not lying there worrying. If you have trust with people, you're not saying, okay, well, is so-and-so going to do this tomorrow? Uh, did this actually get done? It, it, you, can, you free up a lot, of, uh, a lot of brain cycles to do other things or just to rest and recuperate for the, the legitimately difficult things that you have to do day in and day out. I would maybe even add that um, without trust, is it actually even possible to have a cooperation? Meaning, cooperation is that meaning I we we do something together, yes, and there's some goal we want to accomplish. And uh, now I need to trust you that you will bring your part on the table, but you will only actually do it when you trust that I will accept it and work with it, okay? So if I, if you don't trust that, that I will include all the input, all the skills and all the knowledge that you have, it's not even possible right. yeah, to I mean, cooperate. Yeah, there, there are two forms of uh, um, working with other people or, or in um, multi-person coordination. Uh, one of those is cooperation and the other is coercion. So you can have you you can uh, you can coordinate with people through coercion, but that's not but but you but you can't have cooperation without trust. And so you know I, I can get things done uh, by forcing people to do something, threatening them with repercussions if they don't do it. But there's a, a really like it's not like you you might be able to build pyramids in Egypt doing that, but you probably can't build a startup in 2019. Doing that. Can, there be, can there be like too much trust as well? What happens if there's too much trust? Or what is the definition of too much trust? Well, for me, too much trust usually occurs when people have not taken the time to explore the issues in court. You know, when decisions are taken 
too rapidly or superficially or, or yeah, by, by, by dictate or like under, trusting under the pressure. faith too much. Yeah. Like trusting the faith that yeah, everything will yeah. be fine anyway. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, maybe I, I would describe it not so much as being too much trust, but <coughs> it, it's naive trust. Yeah. It's sort of this unexamined trust that, oh well, it, like, like Rain is saying, I, it, it'll be fine, don't have to worry about it. So I, I think that to get more trust, the more you look into the details. The, the more that you examine them and, and then see them working out systematically, and, and then as you see this pattern actually functions, you can let go and, and increase the level of trust through verification. So uh, as we were coming over here this afternoon, uh, Skidder and I were talking about uh, Andy Grove from Intel, who wrote a famous book called Only the Paranoid Survive. Um, there is a very positive aspect of paranoia, so productive paranoia is one of the empirical behaviours of what I call the top 1%. Um, what that means in practice is actually sitting down together, which in itself is a trust-building exercise. This is paranoia about the circumstances, the environment, about what could go wrong, right? And trusting your own people to analyse those situations to point out to you the things that could go wrong, including the things that you may be doing wrong. Or not doing at all. Or not doing at all. Um, so that kind of uh, systematic analysis of the situation, showing trust in the team to, to, to analyze and then to go do, is, 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 is a critical thing. I'm wrapping up this interesting discussion with you with the statement that at the end of the day we cannot really put trust outside ourselves yeah? we can take everything into account but in the final analysis we just need to trust our own discrimination of you know is, is this or is it that or you know so never give the trust away I think that the trust flows from within, but it can never be disconnected from the self. You, you can extend yourself beyond your limits as, a, as an act of trust or love, but it's still connected, it's still you know, heart, hands connected. And I think that, that may, understanding the integrity of between the heart, hands, mind connection is a way of, of ensuring that that trust remains within your own locus of agency. Yeah, what you're saying is, at the end of the day, being able to trust yourself is arguably even more important than trusting other people. And, and that's, harder. Yeah, and much harder. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. You? Hey! Thank Again, you. <laughs> so, I'm, uh, this is not, this supposed to put it here oh. and I want to thank you each one of you so this is for you dear rain thank you so much for moderating this panel and then we have for Skinner thank you. Ooh, you can be. Yeah. and Mark thank you so much thank you